<laughs> Would Baylor have gone to a bowl game in 2011 if it weren't for Robert Griffin III? My answer is yes, they would have, because there was enough talent offensively in order to have still a winning year for Baylor. Case in point, how about Kendall Wright, the all-everything receiver, whom last season had over 1,600 yards of receiving, as well as 14 touchdowns, not to mention 108 catches. Along with the fantastic running back Terrence Ganaway, offensive center Philip Blake, and the other Robert Griffin, talking about Robert Griffin, the offensive lineman, all four of those players picked in this past season's NFL draft. So, in my opinion, Baylor still would have made a bowl game even if you didn't have RG3. But you cannot convince me that Baylor would have won 10 ball games, that they would have beaten TCU at the beginning of last season, that they would have beaten Oklahoma for the first time in school history in that thrilling game in Waco, and also would have gotten to the Alamo Bowl and would have beaten Washington. There's no way you would have convinced me then or now that Robert Griffin III, if he weren't there, that Baylor still would have done what they did last year. He was that important athletically and leadership-wise, and it's no wonder he became Baylor's first Heisman Trophy winner. But now it's life after RG3, and Art Bryles has to prove that Baylor is not just a one-year flash in the pan as far as getting to national prominence. It's going to be hard for Baylor to get back to where they were a year ago, but offensively, if the new playmakers can live up to their billing, and if the defense can show some sort of improvement, then the Bears are capable of another winning season in Central Texas. Rolling with the flow, as in Nick Florence. Three years ago, I took my son to his first ever OU football game, and it was Baylor at OU back in 2009. RG3 didn't play for the rest of that particular season because of a devastating knee injury, and that meant that freshman QB Nick Florence would take over at Baylor. And Florence struggled and struggled big time that day. I think Baylor only scored seven points, and I think OU won that game 32-7 to or something like that. It was a pretty long day for Nick. He was harassed all afternoon long, and to say that Florence struggled would be an understatement. Now, he played a lot that season, but of course, since RG3 came back from that uh, knee injury, of course, Griffin III played much of 2010 and 2011. So, unless it was mop time, you didn't see Florence in ball games for the last two seasons. Now, in his senior year, Florence is once again the signal caller and has a second chance to make a first impression for Baylor, its fans, and all of us watching Baylor football for the upcoming season. Of course, he's not going to be the same type of player as RG3, but then again, who is? Florence is a pocket passer. He's a pro-style type passer, and that means that the offensive line, now more than ever, will really have to hold up to their blocks. Run blocking is something that Baylor has done well in recent years. Pass blocking, which I'll get into in a little bit when I break down the offensive line, has not been their strongest suit. An advantage that Florence is going to have, even though he hasn't played a lot since 2009, is familiarity with both the Baylor offense as well as head coach Art Bryles. And for Baylor fans, they might remember that Bryles was a coach at the Houston Cougars and definitely knows quarterbacks. So Florence knows what's expected from him from Art Bryles. It's that simple. And that's going to help out quite a bit. What will also help out uh, Florence is if he can establish chemistry amongst his receivers. And despite losing um, their best receiver from a year ago, Kendall Wright, first-round uh, draft pick, they still have some terrific receivers coming back. Um, Terrence Williams will probably be the main guy for Nick Florence to throw to, and then other receivers will include Tevin Reese as well as Lanier Sampson. So you've got plenty of speed, plenty of athleticism on the receiver side, despite no right. So I still think that uh, Florence has an opportunity for a good season, but the offensive line will have to hold their blocks, and we'll see just how far the knowledge of Nick Florence has come along in this his final year at Baylor. Well, last season for Baylor, when it came to the ground game, it was basically two guys. Terrence Gannaway, the running back, and of course, Robert Griffin III. 
Well, this year you don't have either guy, so now it's going to have to come from the running backs since Florence is not really known for his legs. Talking about the new running game, which I think is still going to be serviceable for Baylor in terms of getting what they want to accomplish, and that is a solid ground attack. A couple of guys to mention, uh, Jared Salubi, it looks like he's going to be the starter, but also expect the Oregon transfer to get his share of carries and maybe be a starter at some point during the year. And that's Lake Seastrunk, who actually played this high school ball not too far from the Waco area at Temple High School. At that time, he was one of the more highly touted high school running backs in the country. It was, came down to USC or Oregon, and he decided to pick Oregon. And then last year, decided to come back home to Central Texas and come to Baylor, but had to sit out last year because of the transfer rule. And this guy, not only a terrific football player back in high school, but also um, I wouldn't be surprised to see him be a two-sport athlete at Baylor, both football and track. The guy is absolutely blazing speed, I think like a 10-3, 100-meter dash. So I would expect um, Seastrunk to be a multi-sport athlete. And looking at the offensive line for Baylor, uh, these guys have been very instrumental in the Bears' rushing attack in the past. And now they'll have to be for the Baylor running backs. Let's talk about the experienced guys first, and we're talking about Cyril Richardson returning in his left guard position. Um, and also um, they'll have Cameron Kaufhold at a right guard position. He is a senior. Now one guy that's moving from tackle to center in place of Phillip Blake is going to be Ivory Wade, a senior who will probably be the anchor of the team. And the tackles are going to be the most inexperienced positions for BU. Um, Troy Baker, just a sophomore at right tackle, and then at left tackle will be a freshman in Spencer Drango. So these five guys know the task ahead of them. Last season, this team gave up 29 quarterback sacks which doesn't sound like a lot, but keep in mind that RG3 was the most elusive quarterback we've seen in college football in a while. So you can imagine if he wasn't elusive, just how many more sacks Baylor would have given up. So the pass protection, that's going to be a major area of emphasis because Florence isn't the type that's going to make something out of nothing um, in more situations than what Robert Griffin III did. He was that special of an athlete. So the offensive line will have to do a better job of holding their blocks to avoid the pressure on the QB. Otherwise, 29 sacks is going to seem pretty low to the amount that they could give up this season if they don't do their part. Well, how did the Baylor defense do last season? Well, other than stinking up the joint against the run, stinking up the joint against the pass, giving up a lot of points, and being the third worst passing defense in all of college football in 2011, I'd say the Baylor defense did just fine. That's it. Good night. <laughs> okay, there's, well, there's more that we'll talk about when it comes to the Baylor defense, but there's the Cliff Notes version of how they played a year ago. Despite the fact that the Bears went 10-3, and won the Alamo Bowl, and beat both Oklahoma and TCU, amongst other teams, they did so, in my opinion, despite the fact that their defense was so lousy, giving up about 38 points per game. It seemed like anybody that they went against pretty much had their way, and that cannot happen in 2012. Phil Bennett's first year as defensive coordinator, the former Kansas State defensive coordinator, his first season for Baylor last year was a pretty rocky one. The 4-2-5 defense just like Tech's 4-2-5 defense last year, just did not work. They weren't aggressive enough, there were too many blown assignments, and you had defensive backs making more tackles than they needed to, which meant that you had more injuries coming from that secondary, primarily from the corners. Let's go ahead and talk about Baylor's defensive line this year, and one of their few productive players was a guy by the name of Nicholas Jean-Baptiste, who's now gone. So the defensive tackles who will be called upon this year will be uh, K. Ron Johnson, who used to play fullback for Baylor. He, he arrived as an offensive player, but is now making the transition to defense. And then you have a player who arrived from the junior college ranks not too long ago in the form of Nick Johnson. So K. Ron Johnson and Nick Johnson will be the tackles. At defensive ends, um, you have Gary Mason and then also Terrence Lloyd. Now, Terrence Lloyd... Um, 
has been having knee injuries from a while back, and he's not been able to live up to his potential. Now, one guy in particular that Baylor's pretty high on in terms of the linebacking core is going to be a junior college transfer from Riverside College, and that is Eddie Lackey. Lackey is not a very big guy at all. He's only like 220 pounds, but you don't necessarily have to be a big body in order to be an effective linebacker. We've seen this up close in the Big 12 with Tom Ward of OU. Doesn't have a lot of size, but can get the job done. Lackey will now have an opportunity to show his overall speed. He was pretty productive at Riverside C um, just recently. And then helping him out at linebacker will be the middle linebacker, and that is Bryce Hager. Bryce Hager and then Rodney Chadwick should be um, used in 4-3 situations when Baylor runs the 4-3-D. Um, in the meantime, though, he will be Hager's backup. That's Rodney Chadwick. We'll begin at the corners for the Bears with K.J. Morton, who last season came close to having 100 tackles. He had 95 last season. And at the other corner, uh, John Williams, last season he was Johnny on the spot at times, breaking up 12 passes. And then at the nickelback, Ahmad Dixon, he was very active with 89 tackles a year ago. And also at a, another defensive back position, Mike Hicks, over 100 tackles in 2011. He had 105 to be exact. And probably the most talented of the bunch, and that is Sam Hall. Uh, Sam Hall had 113 tackles, leading all the Baylor defensive backs in that department. He will play at a safety position. We will see if the Baylor defense can show any improvement at all, and you got to think they're going to because I couldn't imagine this defense doing worse than what they did last year as far as giving up points and giving up yardage. Baylor was 10-3 and last season, in my opinion, in spite of that defense. Normally when your offense scores 40, 50 points or more, it's usually a blowout win. But instead, these games turned out to be a lot more interesting. A lot of them turned out to be more interesting than they should have been, and that's because the defense was giving up a ton of points and yardage as well. A year of familiarity, in my opinion, can only help this defense under Phil Bennett. And looking at the special teams for the Bears, last season, um, Aaron Jones made 10 of 17 kicks, which is respectable, but you like to see that percentage uh, get around 75 80%, and that should help out if he can do that. And then the punting situation for once last season, Baylor wasn't highlighting their punting department. In the past, they've had all Big 12 and all American punting, and that's because of the fact that they didn't do a whole lot with offensive possessions. But, of course, recently that's changed. And last year, for once, they didn't punt very much, only 29 times throughout the entire season. That meant that Spencer Roth, the returning punter this year for Baylor, didn't get to show his leg off a whole lot, averaging just barely over 40 yards per punt. And then the kick returning game, doesn't look too bad with Antoine Goodley, a modest um, kick returner, and also a punt returner in the name of Levi Norwood, who last season wasn't known for his blazing speed, but he was known for probably getting about six or seven yards per punt return. Was known for making the first guy miss, so that will help to have him back as well. Okay, looking at the Baylor schedule for 2012, there are some opportunities for victories in the month of September, but Baylor's certainly going to have to earn them because I think at least two of those victories um, don't shove into the winner's column just yet because you open up with SMU and June Jones, who's done a nice job with the Mustangs, with the run-and-shoot offense. T former Texas quarterback Garrett Gilbert will be at the helm for the Mustangs. Expect a lot of points in that game in Waco. Get a week off before you play on September the 15th against Sam Houston State, whom last season went to the FCS National Championship game. And then wrapping up non-league play on the 22nd, you play at Louisiana Monroe. And then only one Big 12 home game between September and early November, and that's it for Baylor. They better get familiar with the road because they'll be away from Waco for quite a few conference games until early November. Talking about a game on 
September 29th at West Virginia. Don't see how Baylor can win that one. And then the next week, you get a bye week before the October 13th game against TCU. Last year, it was an exciting game from Waco in which Baylor got the last lap winning in the end. But this time, TCU will be favored to get revenge on the Bears. And then the 20th, they play at Texas, big underdogs there, and an opportunity for a win, perhaps, at Iowa State on October 27th. November the 3rd should be a victory against Kansas. And then November the 10th, you got to go to Oklahoma and play the revenge-minded Sooners. Then the 17th, Kansas State at home. That'll be a tough one. And then in Arlington for the November 24th game with Texas Tech. And that could be the game that decides which of those teams gets the necessary sixth win to go to a bowl game. And they're wrapping up the year early December at home against Oklahoma State. And you'll be playing against a true freshman quarterback in West Lunt, but he would have had nearly an entire season of experience under his belt. So that right there might be a game where Lunt doesn't look like a freshman. He should have 12, 12 games of experience under his belt. Overall for Baylor, their offense is going to score a lot of points, but their defense is going to give up probably even more. I think it will be close for Baylor to get to a bowl game, and I think it's going to come down to that Tech game in order to get to the necessary six wins. I don't think Baylor is the worst team in the Big 12, but I don't think they're going to get to the upper half of the league, and I think that they dropped back somewhat in 2012. I've got them going 5-7 and seven and finishing just out of bowl contention and finishing 8th in the Big 12. Well, I previewed every BCS conference, the BCS Busters, and every Big 12 school except for one. The Oklahoma Sooners, where I'll begin my three-part series on Oklahoma on my next show, part one will be the offense. We'll talk about the Sooners offense on my next pregame show. We'll talk to you soon. See you next time.